the prelim only encompasses the stuff that we did during unit two. Okay, so don't, you know, don't be worried about texture and mineralogy and things like that. Okay, so what I thought I would do today is basically go through each one of these subjects. This is in order of how we did the lecture. Um, go through each one of these with the specific topics that are within them and then sort of open it up for questions. Um, I really don't, I want you guys to sort of bring me the questions rather than me throw them out at you. Okay. Um, so the these are the, the five subjects. We started with soil colloids, um, and then we talked about the four different types of colloids, which then segued right into organic matter. And then we'll, with these two under our belts, we started talking about what pH is and how these two interact with pH, and pH, in fact, interacts with that, or sort in a sense, controlled, the dynamics of the system. We then went into nutrients, because the nutrients fit very well with the colloids in the organic matter, with pH controlling much of the nutrient dynamics. And then we, we shifted gears and we started talking about soil ecology. And I started talking about soil ecology in the, in the sense of how we classify things, because how we classify things give us an idea about what we're interested in. Okay? So why don't we start with soil colloids? Okay? When I started talking about soil colloids, we started talking about the types of colloids. Uh, we talked about the phyllosilicates, the, the amorphous, the non silicate, uh, the non sheet. Sil uh, colloids, we talked about oxides, and then we talked about the organic colloids. We all talked about the organic co colloids in the sense of colloids, not as in the sense of organic matter. Okay? <coughs> now, when we talked about those things, we were very much talking about this issue of the, the, of the structure, what makes this material, what is it made out of, but also how that structure impacts the issue of the edge, okay? the surface areas. And that's when we started talking about the issue of permanent charge as well as the pH dependent charge. Okay. On that note, that segued right into this issue of CEC and AEC. Because of the isomorphic substitution, because of the structural arrangement of these phyllosilicates as well as the other type of colloids, there is a charge associated with these par particles. Okay. Now, oh, let me take a step back. Again, when we talk about colloids, and we talked about this initially, but when we're talking about colloids, we're talking, colloids is a description of a size. Okay? There are a lot of different things that are at that size, but colloids are what size? Basically one micron and smaller. Okay? So this is why surface area is so important. Okay? Now, once we got done with talking about cation exchange capacity, we started talking about this issue of base saturation. Base saturation is a measurement of how much cations are on that cation exchange site. You can have a rather large cation exchange capacity, okay, the capacity, the whole, the whole number, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's all occupied by bases. It could be occupied by protons or aluminum. Okay. Um, and then this was the segue into sort of pH. The next thing we talked about was organic matter, and we started talking about organic matter. I just wanted you to get an, a, a sort of a concept of what organic was and sort of the organic cycle, the carbon cycle. So we talked about the carbon cycle. Uh, we talked about the carbon pools and their fluxes, what they are, what controls them, and what are their consequences. We then went on to start talking about the role of carbon in the environment, particularly in the soil. Okay? But we also talked, when we were talking about this role of carbon, we were talking about biotic and abiotic structures activities, things that were going on, but we also started talking about decomposition. Now, at the same time that we started talking about decomposition, this almost segued into soil ecology because we started talking about how that decomposition occurs, the issue of location, structure, all those types of things, but we also talked about the nature of the organisms that were doing the decomposition and the, 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 the sort of the artifact of that the nature of that carbon and its effect on the, the organisms that are doing the decomposition and the artifact of the decomposition by the organisms on the carbon itself. Right? Do you guys remember that whole conversation? You know, so when we start talking about decomposition, we're basically, and we'll, we'll talk about this in the context of an aerobic system, but we have an organic molecule, whatever it happens to be. Okay, a repeated organic molecule structure. Okay? And in the presence of oxygen, 
generally, this is what we most, most people think as sort of the decomposition process. Now, the reality is there's a lot of other things going on here. We're certainly going to be blowing off CO2, which is this. But we're also going to be getting energy, and we're going to be getting nutrients out of this system. I mean, why are we, why are we eating? It's not to produce this. It's to get this, right? Does that make sense? OK, so the nature of this molecule and the environment in which it is in is going to have a huge impact on what you get out of it. And that was sort of the segue from organic matter to soil ecology. OK? The next thing we talked about was pH. Um, and this was sort of to close out this sort of nutrient end of the spectrum and sort of leg, leg us into nutrients at the same time. Um, but we started with talking about, what, well, what is pH? You know, it's the, this issue of proton concentration, this issue that water disassociates at a constant. Okay? And that disassociation, depending upon what is more predominant from that dissociation in the soil solution, you're going to get a, an acidic system or an alkaline system. Okay? And so we talked about the difference between what hydrogen is and what hydroxide is and the issue of pH versus pOH. Okay? In essence, we, tried, we talked about what pH means. Then the next thing we talked about was what, in fact, controls that pH and, in turn, what pH controls. And then finally, we ended up with talking about buffering, how pHs are modified in the environment, okay, how they're buffered in essence, and the processes that drive that buffering and the processes that control that pH. We then went into nutrient dynamics. Okay. We started with nitrogen, but we basically went through all of the different, well, not all of them, four of the different nutrients. The context here is we're looking at a nutrient cycle that's, predom that's totally controlled by microbial populations or an ecological system to a system where there is basically no ecological controls. I mean, this is always in its ionic form. There's not truly, it's not being put into biomass. It's always in an ionic form, whether it's in the soil solution, whether it is in the biomass of an organism. We talked about what they are, what controls them. Okay, I hear, I hear the pools the fluxes, and what are their consequences? What is the impact of the, these pools and these fluxes on the larger environment? Okay? And that was this whole section that we talked about. This was basically the, the meat of each one of these lectures. Okay? The last lecture section that we had was soil ecology. And this is where we started with classification. But this quickly slipped right into this issue of diversity and abundance, the form and function of those organisms, and then the environmental constraints and opportunities. OK? That, in a nutshell, was what we talked about over the last five weeks-ish, kind of-ish. All right. So what I'd like to do now is open it up to you guys. And I want to open it up by opening it up to soil colloids and see if we have any questions on soil colloids in particular. Go. Yeah, they do. OK, so the pH dependent charge. So we have a, a, a permanent charge. Does everybody sort of get that, the idea that these, these colloids, these small particles, depending on what the kind of material they are, they have a permanent charge. OK? That's associated with their structure. But that structure, depending upon where it interacts with the soil solution, basically all of these colloids have whatever that material is at the edge of, you know, it could be an organic molecule, it could be a, 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 a clay molecule, something like that. All of them basically have this hydroxyl group on the end. Right? This is the edge. So uh, it, from, a, from a, a phyllosilicate, you can imagine. I have a repeating structure that's looking like this. You know, I have a tetrahedral sheet, tetrahedral sheet, and an octahedral sheet. Well, this is that edge. 
that edge is imperfect because it doesn't continue. So I have the oxygens that's binding the aluminum and silica together. And they do not have another aluminum silica over here. So they're exposed to the soil solution. And at that, uh, that oxygen, because it's exposed to the soil solution and it doesn't have a silica or aluminum that it's binding to, is going to be interacting with the protons that are in that soil solution, making, in essence, hydroxide. Okay? Now, this hydroxide is not part of the structure, which means it can interact with the soil solution. Now, what's going to happen if the pH starts to rise? That's going to equal, I'm going to have an increase in what? The concentration of what? OK, if that happens, that OH is going to be going into solution. And it's going to react with this proton, pull it off, and make water. Because it's taking this away, this has a positive charge. So it's going to create a relative increase this is already negatively charged. But what it's going to do is it's going to increase the relative negative charge of this colloid. So in essence, it's going to increase the cation exchange capacity. Does that make sense? All right. Now, what happens when we start adding protons to the soil solution? Well, the pH is going to start going down. Right, with the increase of the proton concentration. This proton is going to start acting, reacting with this hydroxide, this oxygen. Okay, there's no proton here now, right? That proton went with the water. So if I start increasing the proton concentration, those protons are going to start rebinding there. What's that going to do to my CEC? It's going to make it more positive, right? My cation exchange capacity is the ability for this colloid to hang on to positive charges. So if this gets more positive, its ability to hold on to positive charges is going to be going down. Right? Does that make sense? And if I continue to drive this pH down, I potentially can hold another proton here, which is going to make it even more positive which is going to drive my CEC down even more. But what is it going to do to my AEC, my anion exchange capacity? It's going to increase it. So as the pH goes down, my CEC goes down, but my AEC goes up. As the pH goes up, an increase in this, my CEC is going to go up, but my AEC is going to go down. Does that make sense to everybody? Because what I'm doing is I'm changing this relative charge in the colloid. And it's very temporary. And it's totally controlled by the pH. It's not structural. Right? Cool means? OK, go. In this case, this is a buffering reaction. Okay, in, in a sense, because what's going to happen is, right now we're just looking at the protons. But as I start changing these cation exchange capacities, I start putting more and more protons in soil solution, the permanent charge as well as the pH dependent charge, those charges are going to have something associated with them, right? Let's use this board over here. Okay, so here's my colloid again. OK? And we're going to start with a pH that's high. OK? If I have a high pH, what does that mean to my CEC? It's larger, right? OK? If I have a larger CEC, it's going to be more negative. Now, if that's the case, it's going to be holding on, even if it's not, if, as long as I have some CEC, it's going to be holding on to bases. All right? So let's imagine that's a calcium that's being held here. Right? <coughs> All right. So what happens when we start lowering the pH? Okay, I start lowering the pH. I'm going to start seeing, if I start lowering the pH, I'm going to start seeing an increase in the concentration of protons. Right? What are those protons going to do? 
they're going to start, they're going to go into solution and they're going to start competing with this cation exchange site. Now, this happens to be plus two. The proton happens to be plus one. So if this proton goes over there and it hits a plus two, it's probably not going to do anything. This plus two is probably going to hold on. But as I start increasing this concentration, do you guys remember the cation exchange rules? Mass action, right? OK, I'm going to start getting mass action because I have more protons. I start moving enough defenders against that offensive soccer player. Sooner or later, they're going to be able to take the ball away, right? OK, well, I get enough protons. Sooner or later, they're going to knock this cation off. But in the process of knocking that cation off, I'm getting two protons here. What's that going to do to the relative concentration of protons that are in the soil solution? It's going to reduce it. So in essence, it's going to buffer the proton concentration. Does that make sense? Because it, in the process of knocking this calcium off, it's taking two protons out of the soil solution. If I take protons out of the soil solution, I'm, in essence, raising the pH of my active pH. Right? So it's a buffering reaction, all at the same time. Cool beans? I don't know, does that answer your question? Kind? Is that, is that the whole, that's the only way that it's supposed to be said the buffering? This is the kind of buffering that happens in the middle. Remember, we have buffering that happens at high pHs. It has to do with calcium carbonate. And we have buffering that happens at low pHs, which happens to do with aluminum hydroxides, gibbsite. Right? And those are things that you guys should know. Hint. OK, other questions on this one? Do we have to know all the exact types of colloids, like mectite, and that they're two okay, so the, or whatever? So the question is, do I need to know all the exact types of, of calloids? I want you to know the four types of calloids, but I don't necessarily want you to know the specifics of each type of calloid. You need to know what a phyllosilicate is. You need to know what an amorphous calloid is. You need to know what an organic one is. You need to, organic calloid. You need to know what an oxide is. Okay, you need to know what they, what they are. Okay, but you don't need to know all of the two to ones and the one to ones and the two to one to ones of the file silicates. Okay. All right. Next question. We feel. Does everybody feel comfortable about this one? We'll move on to the next. Good question. Okay. So, th what's the difference between CEC and base saturation? So if I have a calloid, okay, it's going to have a certain charge associated with it. And forget about whether it's pH dependent charge or a permanent charge. That colloid is going to have an absolute amount of charge, positive as well as negative. Okay? If it's a negative charge, that absolute amount, and let's imagine that it is 100, 100 okay, that means it can hang on to 100 positive charges. CEC is a measurement of the absolute charge. It's not a measure about what is, in fact, held by it. It's just its measurement. It's got a negative, 100 negative charges. That's it. Base saturation is a measurement of how much of this 100 is occupied by bases. OK, so if I have, of these 100 charges, I have 50 positive charges that are attached. That means I have 50 over 100 times 100 for the percentage. That means I have a 50% base saturation. Does that make sense? Now, as those bases come off, I'm not changing my CEC. I'm just changing the base saturation. Right? Go. The CEC is the charge is reflected. It's the exchangeable. So it's reflected at the surface, but the charge itself may come from internal isomorphic substitution. But OK, so here's my magnet, right? The isomorphic substitution may be inside, but the interaction is going to be at the edges. OK, does that make sense to everybody? Sheila. So, so practically, things like the CEC like can't be 
Okay, so from a practical sense, CEC is, is measured in two ways. One is we sort of have a rule of thumb where sands, we look at a sand, a silt, and a clay. Now, the reality is clays are very different. From, from a laboratory sense, we basically measure this by putting, that was that whole soil solution thing where we put a material in a solution, okay, and we saturate it with something. It could be an ammonium, you know, or a potassium or something like that. We saturate, we drive everything off. And then we take that same solution with the soil in it, and we add something else. And we drive everything else. And then what we do is we measure the ion that we used in the first place. And it will tell us, that, you know, this is a positive charge. I have 100 of these. I have a base uh, a CEC of 100. This kind of measurement doesn't tell me what my base saturation is, though. It tells me what my CEC is. It will t I mean, from a potential state, if you have a sand versus a clay, Right off the top of your head, you should, if I ask you which has got more CEC, with little thought, you guys should think, well, the clay is going to have more CEC. Well, for a lot of reasons. First off, with clays, you're starting to see more and more isomorphic substitution, more charge. But also, I've got a lot of more surface area. A lot of more. A lot more surface area. Right? Go. What is Say that again? What is isomorphic substitution? Isomorphic substitution is when we're talking about this. Uh, Isomorphic substitution is the sort of the, uh, the genesis or of, the, of the structure itself. So we start with these tetrahedral sheets. And so this is the classic 2 to 1 mineral, two tet uh, tetrahedrals and one octahedral. Okay. Well, the tetrahedral, the base structure is a silica. And the octahedral, the base structure is an aluminum. This is reacting with, and this is when I got back to these. So if I have a silica here, you know, an oxygen, an oxygen, an oxygen, this is then bound to another oxygen over here, and then this is a repeated structure with another silica over here, right? Does this sound, look familiar? The isomorphic substitution is the substitution of other elements in for silica or aluminum. And this is where you get the issue of the shape as well as the charge, because no element is exactly the same shape or charge from silica. So if I substitute with silica with something else, I'm either going to get the same charge or I'm going to get a different shape to my colloid. Okay, and that's why I showed you like the smectites have this type of shape, and the kaolinites have a very flat, you know, almost that kind of structure, very flat, plate-like. Okay. Now if I put in a, an element, an ion that has the same charge, I'm not going to change my cation exchange capacity from what the original structure is. But often, I'm going to be putting something in that's the same size, but actually has a different charge. And if I start putting in one thing for another that has a different charge, say I take an iron and put it in for the aluminum, okay, aluminum is 3 plus. If I put in an iron that happens to be 2 plus, I'm making this colloid more negative. And so that isomorphic substitution in this structural, in this structure right here, is going to change the charge. OK? You feel good about this one, guys? Can I leave this light on? Can you still see this? All right. OK, so the next one was organic matter. Any questions there? Um, I mean, we did the carbon cycle. We did the nutrient, all the nutrient cycles that were, like, that were sort of model systems for us to think about. We felt good about the organic matter. We feel good about decomposition and CN ratios and that kind of stuff. Go. OK, so the, there was a, <coughs> do you guys remember the CN ratio, what the CN ratio was? It's the ratio of carbon to nitrogen, right? And there was a rule of thumb there that we said. Um, it, it was like 20 to 1. 20 to 1 basically is the issue. It, because of the decomposition, most of the decomposition is happening by microbial populations. And we use the, the 20 to 1 rule to say if it's greater than 20 to 1, we're going to have nitrogen being basically immobilized, right? Because of the biomass issue of the organisms, the organisms have a biomass CN ratio of like 8 to 12. Okay? And if you think about respiration, some of that carbon is going to be thrown off as CO2. Okay? 
If its CN ratio is less than 20 to 1, we're going to start seeing a lot of mineralization of nitrogen because the microbial biomass, they, does, they don't need all of that nitrogen. Does that make sense? Now, we also sort of mentioned, and, th and this is, you got to take this with, take this with a, sort of a grain of salt. We also said that in general, low CN ratio material decomposes faster than high CN ratio material. You know, but that is really dependent on this issue of what controls decomposition. And do you guys remember the things that control decomposition were? There was basically four rules, but the first one was the driver that really controlled everything. You guys remember what it was? Location, location, location. And that's not the first three, that's the first one. Okay. Then we started talking about the, the, the quality and the quantity of the material, and then the climate that the material was in, and then the availability of that material for the organisms. And so those are those. Does this sound familiar? Yeah? Okay. I, I really want, when we talk about decomposition, I really want you guys, we can talk about CN ratios, we can talk about the structural relationship of the, of the organic molecule. And those do are, in fact, part of the drivers for decomposition. But the most, the, pre, the prime, premier, pre, premier, the most important one is location. I don't care what it is. It could be sugar. It could be easy to decompose. But if there isn't an organism or the climate isn't right, it is not going to decompose. Uh, kata, and then we'll go, go ahead. Doesn't, kata, go. So location, has, so location can mean a lot of things. Okay? Location can mean, I mean, you literally can have an organ, um, organic molecule being occluded. It's covered by something, and the organisms can't get to it. But you can also have an organic molecule located in this prime location, except there might not be any organisms there. Okay? Now, you also could have an, ar, um, a, 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 this is where location sort of trumps everything else. If, the, if that piece of material that's going to be decomposed, or potentially can be decomposed, is in an area that's warm enough but not wet enough. That's a climate control, but it has to do with location. Right? So they, they're, they're interacting there. Right? Now, this also gets into this issue about where the organic matter is put into the system. Okay? Around here, most of the organic matter that's put into the system comes in at the surface, because right? we have leaf fall and things like that. But you start moving into mole soils, grassland systems, yes, there's some coming in from the top. But a lot of that stuff is way down below. And then you have to start thinking, OK, well, the organisms that are doing the decomposition, they have a very select part of the environment that they live in. OK? Now this, I mean, do you guys remember me talking about the actinomyces? This is a really good example. Actinomyces were those spore-forming, sort of filamentous uh, microorganisms. OK? And they basically sort of make colonies. OK? And those colonies can bridge different ecotypes or ecotones inside the soil system, right? Because here. Okay, here's my soil surface, okay? As I go down through the soil surface from, from the top to depth, where should I see most of my organic matter? Up here, okay? So this is why we have O's and A's up here, okay? But this system is also very variable climate-wise, right? It starts to get sunny outside, that means this is going to get dry and hot. Okay? It rains, it's going to get wet and cold. All right? Farther down, climate is more constant. Okay? And it's not amazing, but water flows downhill, right? So all in, in all likelihood, this is going to be moister. All right? So I have an organism that up here is where my carbon stock is. Down here is where my moisture is. Now, if it's dry up here, this carbon stock, nothing's going to happen to it. Now, it may be wet down here, but if there isn't any carbon stock down here, it's not going to get decomposed, right? So these actinomyces basically can build colonies that bridge this divide. So in essence, the organisms are, forget about the actinomyces, think about earthworms. Earthworms, because of their motility, can do this. They go up, they grab the organic matter, they go down, shelter. So 
basically earthworms overcome the limitation of location because they have motility. But if I have a microbial population, one pseudomonas sitting here, if he's not near where that carbon is, he's basically out of luck. Does that make sense? So the location of this carbon has a huge impact on its decomposition. Does that answer the question, Kata? Sort of not. Oh, okay. <laughs> We'll hold off on that one for a bit. Madeline, you had a question? Um, the difference between location and availability. The difference between location and availability. Availability has to do, well, first off, it, obviously it has something to do with, with it being there. But it also has to do with the nature of that material. If I'm an organism that, if it's a wood chip or something like that, and it's me, I can't eat that. I don't have the system, the biological system that can decompose that. So you have to have a specific organism that can, in fact, attack that piece of organism, um, organic matter to decompose it. But isn't that quality? That's quality. But see, these, all of these things are inter they're all interacting each o into each other. The four things that you have are the three nodes, are slightly different than the four that you mentioned. Okay. And there's quality. Or so what you meant, so that's within the nodes. And then the four you mentioned a minute ago were um, location, quality, climate, and availability. But in the nodes, it seems like climate was part of, it was lumped into location, which may be why we're confused as to how location and stuff. Availability yeah, interact. OK. so. The, the notes are saying location, size, and surface area, CN ratio, and quality. Okay? So back to location, when we talk about location, in essence, we're talking about an issue of quality as well as sort of the size and surface area. Because okay? if it's being deposited on the surface, it's probably larger material. As it starts being decomposed, and this goes back to that, that, that net bag, that mesh bag, experiment that we'd looked at, you know, location is going to have a lot, or size and surface area is going to have a lot to do with what has happened to it, right? Okay, and now back to this issue of availability, that relates, relates to all three of these, actually it relates to the location one as well, but availability of a material is not just do I have access to it, availability of material is can I in fact react with it, okay? And that is this issue of CN quality as well as, in a sense, climate. Okay? So these, are the, these things are controlling that decomposition. But it all comes back to this one because this one basically, to a certain extent, controls all of these. It doesn't really control the quality, per se, other than, unless it's, um, uh, other than the, the processing issue. Okay, so if it's gone through a worm's gut, the quality has been changed. Okay, and that worm's gut has a lot to do with location. Okay, that worm is going to be pushing this, the, 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 the pieces out at very specific locations, okay, basically through the worm tunnel and in the, in, and in the, in the casts. Okay? Did that, did that answer the question? That was a comment question. Yeah, sort of. Go. The abiotic issue was um, what do these p things potentially do? What do the products potentially do? And we did this in the lab when we looked at the corn, the, uh, the, uh, the cucumber seedlings. Okay? There is this sort of hormonal response from this organic material. That's one. That's, in a sense, that biotic. But we also talked about these guys' role on the climate. Organic matter, well, you got, uh, not all of you have done this yet. Okay? Um, from a climate perspective, what does organic matter do? If I have more organic matter in my cells, I'm certainly imagining that 
I'm going to have more water storage because of the sponge effect. Potentially how it's distributed is going to have a huge impact on infiltration. Okay? But this is also going to have a huge impact. Uh, organic material is also going to have a huge role on temperature. Right? If I have a black surface and I start, start shining a light on it, it's going, to get dark, it's going to get hot. But on the other hand, these tend to have low bulk densities. And because of that bulk density, the transfer of that heat is going to be very different. And this is when we start talking about mulch. Those of you who have been in lab this week already have an understanding that if I put a heat lamp over a black material, organic material, it's going to get hotter than a lighter material. But that transfer of heat is not going to be very far because of the porosity or the void space of the, the organic material. It doesn't take a lot to heat up temperature, uh, heat up air, but air doesn't have a lot of energy to transfer that heat to other things. Okay? So abiotic controls have a huge effect on this issue of climate, which in turn will have a huge control on decomposition. Yes, no, kind of, question, good, go. The composting, oh, the composting process, yeah. I want you to know about it. I want you to have an understanding of, of, actually, more importantly than the composting, I want you to have an understanding of how, this is more soil ecology than organic matter, but I want you to have an understanding about the feedstock and its response, or, or the, and the response of the population, the ecological population that are interacting with it, and then what are the consequences of that on the environment? And, and not just on the environment, but on other organisms. We feel good about this one? To move on to the next. pH? <laughs> and this, oh. What controls uh, pH adaphically, locally, and regional, regionally? OK, so when we were talking about, I'll start with regional, because that, I think that one might be a little bit easier to see. So what are the controls on pH, regional sort of pH issues? The obvious and first one that we should all be thinking about is what happens when it rains. OK, rain moves through the system, the air, OK? The air has concentrations of CO2 in it. What is it going to make? Carbonic acid, OK? And this goes back to the weak acid in a million years. I can weather everything away. But you know every time it rains, now, there may be other things coming in with the moisture, but every time it rains, I'm going to be increasing the proton concentration of my soil solution, okay? And the consequences that thereof, which we've already talked about, okay? Now, there are other sources of acidity that come in from regional sources, okay? These could be natural sources, such as a volcanic eruption and the rainwater, but it also can be anthropogenic sources, such as acid rain, okay? Coming from stack emissions, from emissions from Anything that's pushing out NOx or SOx up into the atmosphere. That NOx and SOx is going to interact with the water, and it's going to make nitric acid or sulfuric acid. Okay, these are strong acids. They hit the ground, and they're going to acidify the environment that they're in. They may not make it acidic, but they're certainly going to be lowering the pH. Those are regional controls, right? Now, what are the local controls on pH? Certainly, as the parent material, the first one is really parent material. The second one is biological activity. Okay, parent material, as it weathers, it's going to be throwing things into the soil solution. Okay, a lot of those are going to be bases, so that weathering, in a sense, is going to be acting as a buffering. Okay, but weathering of primary minerals or secondary minerals of rock material is a slow process. But biological activity, on the other hand, is really fast. Okay? Generally, biological activity produces acidity. Okay? Decomposition processes produce acidity. Now, those aci that acidity is going to be localized to those organisms, and it's also going to be dependent upon material to actually decompose. Does this sound familiar? Go. Local.
Yeah, I mean, we can talk about the specifics of that. I mean, if it's if I have a so the question is if I have um, a, a source of sewage water or something like that. I mean, you could certainly imagine acid mine waste and stuff like that coming out in the streams. Is that considered regional or edaphic or local? Yeah, I think it's a scale dependent thing. I would, I mean, certainly I would imagine the sewer system being a sewer spill or something coming from a septic system or something like that. I would think of that as a local effect, but that certainly there are downstream effects. I mean, you can think of uh, uh, manure applications and stuff like that. Yes, there's a local effect, but there's also a regional effect. Go. Well, the weathering of material is actually going to raise the pH. Okay. Um, any short, -term short term raising a pH, not really. Most okay. most biological activities, most sort of un un except that unless it's an abiotic process, it's a result of acidity or something like that driving weathering processes. Most of the system we are always sort of driving towards acidic systems. Oh, sort of a, a fluctuation type of event. Well, yeah, certainly you can have situations like out west where you're looking at rain systems that, you know, you, uh, this is sort of more salinization, but the salinization is going to raise the pH. So if a rain system, water hits the entire system, it solubilizes stuff. It was soluble, the water basically moves down into the bottom of the basin, okay, with the soluble salts. Well, the water starts evaporating, the salts are left behind. That's going to be raising the pH. Is that the type of situation well, I mean, you're talking I'm about? Thinking, like, here we have a rain event, something, some area saturates, right. becomes more acidic once it, you know, a few days later, once it drains. Dry yeah, down, so, well, the pH kind of yeah so, I mean, that type of scenario, which you're looking at, I think you're looking at a, something, a scenario that's like this, where we have wetting and drying sequences, okay? You know, and we start at a certain pH, and so this is pH here, and this is time. You certainly are going to see, you know, generally the, the trend that we're going to see is something that looks like that, okay? But the reality is that it's going to be you know, doing that kind of stuff to get down there, okay? Does that make sense to everybody, this issue? Okay, it's not like it's, you know, and, and there's certainly geologic processes and things like that. So it, it, you're really talking about sort of a time scale. What time scale you're talking about? You're talking about an ele ecological time scale. You're talking about a pedological time scale. You're talking about a geological time scale. Now, if you're looking at an ecological and pedological time scale, this is what you're seeing. So what's pedological? pedological soil. Okay. okay. When you start looking at a geologic time scale, this is not necessary. I mean, you could see seeing this, and then all of a sudden you can have some sort of event. And, you know, it's, there, I mean, there's all these stochastic events. And even in the pedological, I mean, you can have a stochastic storm coming in, bringing material. But when, in those types of systems, you're starting to see regional effects rather than a DAF effects. You know, if it's a localized effect, this is what you're going to be seeing. Okay, this is not until you see, sort of see a, some sort of regional stochastic event. Is there a correlation between CN ratios and pH? Well, I mean, that. I, off the top of my head, I don't have a, a clear answer on that one. I, I would think to tend to think that. As the CN ratios decrease, we're seeing, in general, more rapid decomposition. And if we have more rapid decomposition, we're seeing more biological activity, which would create more rapid acidification. But I'm not sure that that's a trend that we should, yeah, I'm not sure that's a strong correlation. So any other questions on this one? Hold on, go. Right. Now, how does that explain in like the cases we saw at the compost that were actually? Ah, but that's a stock material. Okay. okay. So the compost is a really good example. Okay. Generally, when we think of decomposition, you're seeing, you're, you're thinking, I'm seeing acidification. But acidification is not necessarily a measurement of pH. Acidification is a, a, me a relative measure of pH. If my material started at pH 10 and it ends at 9, my pH, these are still alkaline materials, but I am seeing acidification. Now, part of what we're going on with the, at the compost facility is this issue that of our stock material. Where, what is it the, the material that we are decomposing? Yeah. Okay. And you've got to think about where it comes from. Well, if it comes from 
cafeterias, you know there's a lot of salts in it. We just put salts in our food, probably too much. Okay? Um, if it's coming from barn waste and it's a cement pad or something like that, and the scraping up the cement pad, you know you're going to be picking up calcium carbonate from the limestone that's in the cement that's going to be out there. Okay? And so as a result, we, the compost that we have tends to have a lot of salts in it. And that's why it goes through that curing phase where, actually not the curing phase, where it goes through the rinsing phase. It's not, we don't call it rinsing phase, but it's basically rinsing. That's why it sits in that big windrow and it's exposed to the, the real world for, you know, for six months. Okay? All right, let's move on. Oh, Madeline, you had a question. Uh -huh. So the calcium carbonate buffering reaction, this is the buffering at the high end. So, so let's, um, you guys did an experiment in the lab and you did basically, you used two buffering reactions of calcium. One was a calcium hydroxide. This is one you started with. And then the next one was calcium carbonate. That's an A, sorry. OK, now we add an acid to this, what's going to happen? Well, you start adding the acid to this, and we'll make this as a balanced equation. OK, two protons, they're going to react with that hydroxide. OK, and basically what they're going to do is they're going to put calcium into solution. This whole system is an aqueous solution, right? It's not calcium hydroxide powder, OK? I add the acid. These protons are going to react with that hydroxide, and it's going to make water. It's actually going to make two water, OK? So in essence, what I've done, this is coming in the solution. I've basically neutralized it, OK? Now, I can keep putting protons into solution, and as if I don't add more calcium hydroxide, sooner or later, we're going to lose this buffering reaction. And at that point, the pH is going to start dropping. Okay, the same thing is going to happen here with calcium, calcium carbonate. Now, generally, when we think about calcium carbonate, because we're thinking about this as a liming reaction in soil systems in the real world, we have to think about what the acid is coming as. Now, when I add two protons in like this, I could be adding it as hydrochloric acid or something like that. But in all likelihood, it's coming in as carbonic acid. Water plus CO2 making carbonic acid. Okay, that proton, now this is not going to be a balanced reaction. That proton is going to react with this carbonate and basically do the same thing. And I probably should do this with two of them. Okay, what's going to happen here is this, these protons are going to react with that calcium, put it into the soil solution. One of those protons, because this happens to be carbonic acid, tends to be, uh, is a weak acid, it's not going to completely dissociate the protons. Which means what I'm going to get is I'm going to get HCO3 and one proton. Okay, this was a really strong buffer. It neutralized both of those protons. The calcium carbonate, on the other hand, only is neutralizing one. Now, what we generally do is we just add more calcium carbonate. So I double the amount of calcium carbonate that I have over the calcium hydroxide, and I basically get the same effect. Okay? In essence, I'm buffering that by reducing the amount of protons that are reacting. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, I don't think I have a lot of time. Uh, let's go straight to soil ecology. Any any sort of obvious questions in soil ecology? Do we feel comfortable with this? Yeah? Go. How much of the safari should you know? You should know less about the safari and more about how they're interacting with each other. Okay? The, safari, uh, the classification is what I'm really, why we classify things. Okay, I, I presented it as a safari. You know, there's this kind of organism and that kind of organism and this kind of organism. I, I don't watch, I don't focus on the specific organisms. Specific, focus on their interactions, how they activate, how they operate, okay, how they're interacting with other organisms and what they're doing to nutrients and pH, okay, and organic matter. Okay, you guys, cool?
All right, I will see you Monday morning. Prelim is in here. Friday, yeah, not my first. I'll see you. I'm not here Friday. Yeah, Friday morning. Friday morning here.